So then I also watched not one, not two, but five films from director Kaisuke uh, Kinoshita. I was going to watch two. I was going to watch the Carmen films because they star my girl Hideko Takamini. And then I fell in love with this director. And then I discovered that we have 43 of his films. And I don't think I'm going to get through 43 of his films if I want to watch all these other films. And it's very stressful um, because he's really good. And I found out that he was openly gay. So he's like this queer filmmaker that I knew nothing about. We have almost his entire filmography. And I feel like I've just wasted my entire life not watching any of this Japanese cinema for so long. I don't know what I was thinking. But I'm glad I'm watching it now. So, um, Hideko Takamini and, um, what is her name? What is her name? Where did it go? Oh my god. Uh, Toshiko Kobayashi starred as Lily Carmen and Maya Akemi in two films. Carmen Comes Home and Carmen Falls in Love or Carmen's Humble Love. There's a couple of different names for that one. Carmen Comes Home was the first Fuji color technique color film period it was Fuji color but it was the first color film in Japan it was one of the first uh, post-occupation films um, released it was a huge hit uh, it's a film about a modern girl a modern city girl as she says Carmen who has left the country gone to Tokyo embraced westernization um, bright colors western clothing Yes, ladies and gentlemen, she's a stripper um, going by the name of Carmen now. And she's come home with her girlfriend because they are tired of being um, hit on by men and they just need a relax. Um, however, they are too racy for um, the countryside and they scandalize her father and family and the village and everything. And then they leave in a trail of fabulous, fabulous dust. Um, and it's it's a fun film that looks at the culture clash of uh country life versus city life and um traditional Japanese ways versus post-war war western uh, westernization so fascinating film for many reasons and um Hideko is amazing and it, it very much this coupled with the second one reminded me of the kind of films that Glenda Farrell and Joan Blondell made in the 30s they're sort of two girlfriends traveling around with shenanigans type films. Um, so the other one, Carmen Falls in Love, basically first it opens and you discover that um, Carmen's friend has been uh, knocked up and abandoned by some dude. So now she has this baby um, who Carmen keeps telling her to abandon. And she's like, you only say that because you've never been pregnant and you don't know what it's like to attach to a child. And you're like, what is happening? Um, and then at one point they contemplate becoming prostitutes to feed the baby, but they decide not to do that. Um, but they become like nude models and uh, singing in cl nightclubs and all kinds of things. There's one sequence where um, Carmen is upset because she's broken up with her boyfriend, who was a womanizing jerk of a, a an artist anyways. And... Um, the nightclub owner is going to fire her and then her friend has the baby strapped to her back and comes at the club owner with a sword trying to get him to get her to give her friend her job back it's nuts and amazing and then it's shot with this crazy cinematography where it um does a lot of dutch angles and weird zooms and things and i guess they were just trying out like new technology it doesn't all work but it's really fun and i really really enjoyed this one it was just so funny um, and the girls had such great chemistry together. And um, I don't know what Hideku Takamini can't do because she can play every emotion. She's amazing. Um, which brings us to the third film I watched, The Tattered Wings, also known as um, Distant Clouds, also known as Tui Kumo. And um, I believe it's based on a novel, but I'm not 100% sure on that. Um, the Tattered Wings comes from a Gide book, and I think the Gide book inspired this story basically it's about a woman who um who was in love with a man who went off to fight the war and during that time her family um was about to lose all their money and so they married her off to a rich family however her husband beat her 
was awful, was in, in fate, unfaithful, and eventually went off to the war and, and died himself. Um, so then Hideko Takamini's character is, uh, has her, her daughter and is, per tradition, about to marry her brother-in-law. When her uh, old love comes back from the war and tries to convince her to leave everything and come to Tokyo with him. However, if she does that, she's gonna her family's gonna lose all this money. She's gonna have to abandon her child, and it's a whole thing. And it's like, oh no! And they set it up like her old love, pretty good. Her brother-in-law, actually a nice dude. So there's a, a real um, emotional sort of. Uh, weight to the, the love triangle but the ending freaking broke my heart it was one of those amazing um train farewells like I need a super cut of all the great romantic bittersweet train farewells in cinema um because put this up on there it was just lovely um and sad and 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 great and she's just such a great actress um highly recommend that one. So then the fourth one I watched is based on a novel by Sachio Ito and it's called She Was Like a Wild Chrysanthemum and it's from 1955 and it feels a bit like um, a film that would come later, uh, Bergman's Wild Strawberries. It's about an old man um, revisiting his, where he, his, his uh, homeland and uh, remembering a lost first love. And so the film is him as an old man on um, a, a like a rowboat going down the river down to his village, and then it flashes back to fifty years earlier, which was um, I'm forgetting the period in Japanese. There's a term for it, but there's a, a, the first period in Japanese imperial um, culture as opposed to when they were feudal, uh, and the beginning of Westernization is roughly. Uh, coincides with the Belle Epoque um, and he's in love this man is in love with his cousin happens a lot in islands they're not really you know um, there she's older and should be marrying somebody else but he's in love with her and at first doesn't know it and it's like why is everyone talking about how we're friendly and then later it's like oh that's why um, and then he goes off to school, and they keep them apart, and she ends up getting married. And then in true tragic tradition, you know, the she didn't fit well with the people she married, and spoilers, she dies tragically. And um, so he's just thinking back to all of the um, opposition their relationship had throughout all these phases, and then the tragic end. And, oh boy, was it a tragic end. It was, like, intense. And there was wailing, and I was crying, and it was sad, and there's chrysanthemums, and and um, bluebells, and all kinds of things, and it was just lovely and sad and wonderful, and a great uh, nostalgia film. Um, and and the the flashbacks are shot like silent film, like because it would be during the silent film era, which I thought was an interesting artistic touch. So the last film I watched was called Spring Dreams. And it's a uh, similar esque to the man who came to dinner in that a stranger winds up having to stay at a rich family's home after taking taken ill. However, it's not an acerbic um, wit who is insulting everybody. Instead, it is a poor um, sweet potato vendor who has no shoes and no family and has a stroke in the living room selling sweet potatoes to the um, maids of this rich family. So he gets stuck there and that brings the story into this household and you see this sort of very eccentric family dealing with uh, various things. There's a son who's dealing with the fact that he's come, trying to come to terms with the fact that life's absurd and having an existential crisis. There is an old maid, um, family friend. There is um, a girl who wants to marry uh, an artist, but she also needs to marry wealth for someone to take over the family business there's her father who is just trying to make um he's like a bad capitalist if you will and their mother and then the grandmother who is the matriarch who gave up true love for the family business and now has these five horrible grandchildren that she doesn't like um and the one daughter who is just 
freely sleeping around and does not care what anyone thinks about her. And it's just one of those sort of crazy eccentric family type movies. But it's shot in this beautiful sort of Cirquean color palette. Um, and it's definitely sort of a eccentric family satire. Um, and it's definitely satirizing aspects of um, the, the soci sociological um, bits of that part of Japanese culture and that time in Japanese culture, 1960, that I am not well versed in. Um, but there are at least three different uh, socioeconomic classes represented in the story. And then, um, meanwhile, in the background, there is a workers' strike happening um, that is marching closer and closer to this house. And then the end is this crazy ending um, that's just fantastic. So um, that was five films from Keisuke Kinoshita, um, my new favorite Japanese director. I don't know. I quite loved all of these. He's one of those guys that just did everything. And I have so many more of his films to watch, and I'm never going to catch up. And it's, I gotta go to bed. I need to sleep. So I'm going to go to bed. But uh, you should watch these movies. And I wish I hadn't spent two years neglecting this um, epic sea of Japanese cinema, I have failed. Have a good night.